My name is Lee Reeves. I'm a retired veterinarian, a husband and a dad and a granddad. I've also lived with uh, stuttering for almost 70 years, having begun to stutter when I was about three. Now, I don't stutter uh, with the frequency or the intensity that I did when I was much younger, but I still stutter. And I like to say that I stuttered yesterday. I have and will stutter sometime today. And hopefully, I will stutter tomorrow because it means that I'm still alive. And my experiences with uh, stuttering are not unlike many of you. Uh, I've been embarrassed. Uh, I've been made fun of, laughed at. I've been frustrated, angry, and even despondent. I've also been uh, discriminated against and had too many microaggressions aimed at me to even count. I've also been proud, though, not proud that I stutter, but proud that I'd done something about it on my own behalf. And what I mean by that is that not because someone else thought it was important for me to do or something that I should do, but because of some things that I chose to do for myself. In public school, I had several speech therapists. Most were nice, a couple were not, and in, in retrospect, um, I think that they were all trying in their own way to help. None of them were successful in relieving my struggle, um, my struggled speech or my negative feelings about myself that impacted my ability to communicate. But two of them had a very important uh, impact on me as an individual. One helped me to understand that stuttering was only a small part of who I am. That is, that stuttering did not need to define me. The other introduced me to the concept of self-help by suggesting that I attend a newly formed self-help group. The last formal therapy I had was in college, which was also when I started my own first self-help group. I started the second group a few, I started a second group a few years later and have continued to be actively involved with stuttering self-help support groups and organizations for the past 40 years. One of my interests has been the history of stuttering and its treatments, uh, as well as the role of self-help and support groups in improving the lives of those of us affected by stuttering. Over the last couple of years, I've been interested in the disabilities movement and the relationship to stuttering. Central to that relationship has been questioning whether the so-called medical model for diagnosing and treating stuttering should be replaced with a social, a political, or a so-called relational model. Now, I believe that challenges to the medical model are both justified and healthy. However, it's not new. Uh, since at least the time of Hippocrates, who is the father of modern medicine, and Aristotle around 365 BC, uh, physicians, philosophers, and scientists have been theorizing about the cause of stuttering and developing treatment aimed at curing the malady. Aristotle, who himself was described it as an apoplexy or a seizing of some interior part of the body caused by an imbalance of what he called the humors, that is the four liquids of uh, the body, uh, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, and their relationship to uh, the natural elements of hot, cold, wet, and dry. He postulated that stuttering was the result of an imbalance causing coldness, and that in turn caused a seizing up of the inner parts of the body. His suggested treatment then was wine, since it warmed the body. He also described an emotional component or melancholy affecting those who hesitate in their speech. So even as early as 365 BC, stuttering almost 2,500 years ago, stuttering was described as having two components, a physical, that is a seizing, which many of us today may describe as being stuck, 
and an emotional component that we might refer to today as fear, as, as the fear or anxiety that we feel in response to a moment of stuttering or the anticipation of stuttering, or perhaps even the despondency of how we're treated in society. If treatments proposed by Aristotle, Hippocrates, and other men of science, other men of science were considered a medical model, then other uh, non-medical treatments were also practiced uh, during that same era. Uh, Demosthenes, another Greek, is a good example. Rather than seeking aid from people of medicine or philosophy or religion, he took a more pragmatic approach. It is said that he hired an acting coach uh, to teach him to speak like eloquent actors. His treatment involved physical exercises to strengthen his lungs, placing pebbles in his mouth, and speaking loudly over the ocean waves. There are many examples of both medical, surgical, as well as uh, other treatments, as well as challenges by those that were non-medical treatments using uh, a variety of different things and devices. They've been written about for hundreds of years. Many from each camp, both the, the medical and the non-medical, offered quick cures, as some do today. There's also been a long history of social stigma as well, from James Hunt's book in 1860, Stuttering and Stammering, The Nature and Treatment of Them Both. He states that stammerers and stutterers are frequently looked upon as careless, petulant and, and an indolent class, a set of imbeciles. He went on to say that these painful Im impediments constitute not only a barrier to the common intercourse and enjoyment of life, but to individual advancement in any class or a professional or social pursuit. The first organized challenge to the medical model for stuttering that I'm aware of was the self-help movement of the 1960s. Stuttering was not the originator of that movement, just as it is not the originator of the disabilities movement today, but it benefited from the movement's influence and its success. The self-help movement began because people who were suffering from a variety of diseases, conditions, and life circumstances were frustrated and angered by the elite establishment. And I must say that speech uh, professionals were included in that establishment. They were frustrated because that group had created an illusion of possessing uh, a special knowledge and skills that only they could provide. Those who stuttered were included in that population, we were frustrated by physicians and speech therapists who first told our parents not to worry, that we would outgrow it. And then when we didn't, our failures were caused because we just didn't try hard enough. While small groups of uh, people who stutter had communicated and met with each other before the 1960s, the environment was ripe for the stuttering community to organize and begin developing more and larger self-help groups and organizations. It was during this time as a high school student that I attended my first self-help group. There were some small groups around the country that had good relationships with professionals, including the one that I had attended, but the stuttering community as a whole had become antagonistic and very distrustful of the professionals. For their part, uh, professionals were equally antagonistic and did not appreciate being challenged. In retrospect, I think we both had some justification that was fueled by false expectations of each other. We expected to be fixed, uh, which was what we were led to believe they were trained to do. This was a, an unrealistic expectation. On the other hand, they expected to fix us if we followed their instruction, which was also an unrealistic expectation. We weren't broken. 
and you're not broken today. Nevertheless, the chasm that was created took many years to close. Eventually, though, we came to understand that we were all after the same thing, helping ourselves as individuals and helping others to lessen the struggle of communicating and diminishing the negative impact that the stuttering has had on our, on our lives. Over the last 25 years or so, uh, the stuttering and the professional communities, including speech language pathologists, researchers, and academics have recognized the value of working together. Having joint conferences, inviting representatives from uh, each community to serve on certain boards and councils, supporting research and this, uh, clinical specialization, Having people who stutter speak at graduate classes to share their, their stories, and it goes on and on. More specifically, events like today, for example, or International Stuttering Awareness Day Online Conference, the Joint World Conference on Stuttering, and the excellent awareness campaign created by STAMA through uh, the British Stammering Association. All of these things and more have been beneficial to both stuttering and the professional communities, perhaps to a lesser degree so far, society. Some of us have found uh, success in achieving uh, both a decrease in the struggle to speak, as well as, in, as, well as improvements in self-perceptions and confidence. Those successes have often taken a variety of paths and through fits and starts and have been achieved by persevering, commonly utilizing a variety of combinations of approaches, including for many uh, professional services offered through the so-called medical model. Others have found a way to come to terms with and be comfortable with their stuttering just the way they are. Still, with all the progress that has been made, stuttering still exists. From children to adults, millions of people continue to suffer, not only from the struggle of simply trying to verbally communicate, but of also being stereotyped, stigmatized, and discriminated against. No specific cause has been discovered and no specific treatment has been universally or consistently effective for all leading once again to frustration by many who are affected by stuttering. Enter the disabilities movement that introduces a social model that shifts the emphasis away from treating the individual represented by the medical model to a social model or society at large. In the limited we have here together, my point is not to argue or to debate uh, the merits of these or any other proposed models for how stuttering is viewed or treated. As I said at the beginning, I think it is justified and healthy to challenge the, the status quo on all fronts. Challenging the medical model or calling attention to the role and responsibility of society uh, in allowing stereotyping, stigma, and discrimination to exist or to be perpetuated is a righteous, noble, and in my uh, view, a timely undertaking. However, blaming or holding others responsible for our condition, our station in life, in my opinion, is not particularly healthy and could lead to a repeat of the divisions that occurred during the self-help movement of the 60s. The good news is that at this point, both stutterers and professionals who are engaged in the disabilities movement are having open and congenial relationships and conversations. And I'm optimistic that we'll have uh, some positive outcomes. Ultimately, the only ones who can truly affect change is us. Even though we're not exactly a homogeneous com community, to say the least, we who stutter both individually and collectively are the ones responsible for telling our story and helping society, uh, professionals, and others to better understand our lived experience. The irony is that we cannot do it alone. 
We need clinicians, researchers, academics, politicians, and community leaders, along with stuttering self-help or, or organizations. We can avoid the mistakes of the past if we realize in the end that we're all in this together. So I want to thank you for logging in and for listening. And uh, I think we have a few minutes um, to maybe have some comments or questions from others. Hi, Lee. Um, hi, Jeff. Hi. Uh, I want to thank you. This was uh, no, thorough in terms of your your historical perspective about how we how we got here today. Um, I, I've been in the self help stuttering world for about thirty years, and I've seen how <clears throat> how there is a lot more um, communication sharing between consumers and, and professionals, but there's still still some gaps as well. And uh, yeah, 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 it's good to remember where we came from. So thank you. You're welcome. You know, I, uh, I'm an advocate, always have been. I'm not an activist. And I will admit up front that activism makes me uncomfortable. Uh, but at the same time, I also realize and understand that that it takes activism to bring attention to and to begin these sometimes awkward kinds of discussions. But it does cause us all, I think, to re-evaluate uh, our own thoughts and beliefs and um, either to defend them and I think oftentimes uh, to sort of challenge our own thoughts and maybe move a little bit to the other side. So, uh, yes, sir, um, Kunal? Oh, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, thanks so much, Lee. I, I mean, uh, one question I had for you, because like, uh, I, I, know, I know there's a part of your speech whenever you're talking about how, how stutters uh, continue to, to suffer today from you know, being able to, to, to get their speech out and also from the societal challenges. So, I mean, I, I, I guess in, in your mind then, I guess, um, you know, where, like, how, like, how, like, is, like, um, I, I, I guess, do do you think the a lot of the suffering then it like is 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 not so much self inflicted as opposed to like people start just responding to societal um, uh, dynamics? Well, I think that's a great question, and I, I think it's not an either or. Quite frankly, I think we all suffer in in, in internally, not really necessarily. Even if even if society. Uh, accepted everything. We lived in a, a utopian world. If we were still struggling with our speech, and I think that really stuttering would still exist, I think individually, many of us would still uh, uh, want to try to do something to, to really be like others, if you will. And, and so we have self-stigma, I guess, is a part of that, that we, the, that we suffer in internally because we're apart from others in this particular way. Um, and as a result of that, then society has a role, of course, in, in um, viewing us um, in kind of a negative way. And I think it's up to us to change uh, that dynamic and to change that story. I think we have to get out and tell the world uh, in as best ways as we can that yes, we, we sometimes have interrupted speech and some of us have more interruptions than other, but we, we have contributions to make to society. And, and because we stutter a little differently, it, it should not define who we are as human beings. Hey, Lee. Yeah, Paul. Uh, just uh, to amplify, to amplify uh, what you said, uh, in my perception, the, the severity of my speech was, for the most part, controlled by me, it wasn't always 
the perception from the people I was speaking with. And as I mentioned a while ago, up into my 20s, 90% of my speech was stuttered with horrible facial contortions. My jaw would lock. And I did some of the things you talked about years and years ago about the crutches and the thumper and uh, and and all those things. And I feel for me, I started to speak more fluently in my ability to communicate. And the more comfortable I was with myself and talking and not caring how other people viewed me, this is the level of speech I have now compared to when I was in my 20s while I still stutter, but it's a lot less than when I was in my 20s. And this is because I decided, irregardless if people want to hear me talk or not, I'm going to speak with conviction, with more confidence. And I believe that opened the door for me to feel less stress and anxiety with opening your mouth to a new person for the first time. I don't care anymore. <laughs> so that's all I, I, I had to add. Well, Paul's comments uh, was a great um, note to end this uh, session on. Uh, Lee, Thank you, Tom. do you have any, any last words of wisdom for the group? Well, I guess in my opinion, um, there are really uh, a couple of things that are, I think, going to be constant. I think that stuttering is part of the human condition, and in my opinion, will probably exist uh, for all time, or at least during my lifetime. And the other is that we are going to be judged by others, uh, and that's part of the human condition as well. So I think while neither one of these at the moment can be eliminated, I do think there is a lot that we can do to try to minimize both.